Hello, my dear listeners. Happy Friday. Nathan Williams here. I am sans Neil this morning. It is morning for me. Uh, I do have my basso profundo voice. That's how you can tell it is still morning, and I'm still drinking my coffee. Neil, a few weeks ago, was able to conduct an interview with Dr. Agalos Kayas. He's the chief scientist for IOHK, teaches at the University of Edinburgh, and since conducting that interview, IOHK has launched their ICO for Cardano Coin. And I understand it's doing quite well, so we're very supportive and very uh, glad for them. Hope it works out well. Um, Dr. Kayas has done a lot of research around proof-of-stake systems, and that's what Neil was able to interview him about. And so, without further ado, join me on this nice Friday morning for a light-hearted romp through the in-depth technology and world of IOHK and proof-of-stake systems. Hi, Neil here. Joining me today is Agus Kayas, the Chief Scientist at IOHK. Thank you for joining me for this interview today. How are you doing? Hey, so doing great and uh, glad that I'm here with you today. So for our listeners, Agus presented Ouroboros, I, I hope I got that right, a, a blockchain protocol at Crypto 2017. So can you give us a simple explanation of the protocol? And uh, what type of problem is it trying to solve? Yeah, sure. So, um, first of all, this is about proof of stake. Uh, so, and proof of stake is uh, um, a very interesting alternative way of uh, building a blockchain compared to a proof of work blockchain, which I assume um, every, all your all your listeners are quite familiar with. So, proof of stake is is an idea also that goes back a number of years, uh, back to the ideas that people were. Uh, discussing in the blockchain forum. Um, and their problem early on was that proof-of-work-based blockchains, they do not scale very well. Uh, they also like very energy-hungry. So, so, and as they scale to large numbers, they get uh, uh, more and more energy. Uh, the energy expenditure grows more and more. Um, so, so early on, people were discussing about this, and there was a lot of interest in figuring out different ways that uh, a blockchain protocol could be designed. So one of the ideas uh, was, was a proof-of-stake uh, proof idea, which basically substitutes the proof-of-work mechanism uh, with a proof-of-stake so-called mechanism that uses the stake itself as recorded in the blockchain as a way uh, to run this election process that nominates one of the participants of the network to produce the next block. So this is the basic, uh, uh, the basic premise behind proof of stake. And the nice thing about it is that once you make this, if you want, self-referential way of introducing the next stakeholder, you don't really need to do proof of work at all. The reason is that the blockchain itself contains uh, all the information necessary, cryptographic keys in this particular case, to validate the next block. So as long as you design it properly, uh, the whole system could circumvent the need for proof of work altogether. Um, however, something that was also early understood by our community was the fact that designing these protocols is not at all simple. Um, and this is uh, why it took, uh, it took years uh, to produce proposals that are convincing. So Ouroboros is, uh, is such a proposal, and the first such proposal that was uh, published in a peer-reviewed uh, uh, conference, uh, scientific conference for cryptography, as Crypto 2017 uh, uh, was this summer. So um, I think you hit on some interesting points that we're going to cover later on, but one thing I'm curious about is how was it received at Crypto 2017 and what are the next steps with its development? Yeah, so, um, well, the reception was extremely good um, and this uh, perhaps points to one of the assets of uh, Ouroboros as a protocol that designing Ouroboros was not 
just about producing a protocol, but it was also about producing a clean, simple mathematical argument that the protocol actually works. So this was like the most important um, aspect, if you want, in the design of Ouroboros, and this is what it sets it apart from other proof-of-stake protocols. So while the ideas of proof-of-stake um, have been discussed by many people in our community, there was no effort, at least effort to the level uh, that we put behind Ouroboros, to explain why the protocol actually works, why you cannot subvert its operation. So this was the part that the presentation at Crypto um, actually focused. So the protocol itself is one uh, thing if you want, but explaining in mathematical terms, if you want developing a theory, a mathematical theory of why the protocol actually is secure, is, uh, was the most important contribution uh, in Ouroboros uh, design. And somehow, if you want the development of the protocol and the development of the security arguments and the mathematical theory behind them was in parallel. So, given that it's, it's mostly theory, I'm sure a lot of people got excited um, about all of uh, all the work you've put in and what you shared with the community as well. Are there any plans to develop a prototype? Because I'm sure you know that's the next big step for, for what you've proposed. Yeah, so um, we, we are actually very, very in a very intense development uh, right now. Uh, Ouroboros will be at the core of Cardano, uh, which is the blockchain that uh, will be launching by IOHK uh, later on this year. Uh, so, so the protocol will be available and will be part of Cardano um, as it will be serving as its uh, settlement layer, essentially the basic backbone that the protocol uh, will be relying on for consensus. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Cardano in, in a few minutes, but one thing that I found uh, very interesting in, in some of your videos that are available on YouTube um, on the IOHK uh, channel was that you had advertised um, for, uh, for positions at the University of Edinburgh for um, for some positions for a PhD uh, in your program there. Have you had much success in terms of applicants? Because when you look at this crazy price boom that we're going through at the moment, sometimes that can be great because it helps with awareness uh, and makes more people want to be involved in, say, blockchain development. But at the same time, it can also mean that people end up chasing the money. So we've, we've less people say getting involved in the development. And of course, that development is extremely important for the long term term uh, blockchain ecosystem uh, development for the future. Yeah, um, so that, that's a great point. Um, there's always, um, if, if you think about it, there's always like, you know, two roads like that, that one can choose, uh, that, that, pe that people can choose uh, when, they, when they try to approach basically anything. Um, so, and especially for something which is as hot as, as blockchain, it's always um, uh, especially these days, very alluring to just say, oh, I want to engage and I want to engage as soon as possible and, and try to make as a big impact um, as soon as possible. Um, and we, we've seen that happening on and on. With, let's say the recent ICOs is a, is, is a great example of that, of how people like, you know, want to engage immediately um, with, uh, with this like emerging market. Um, but at the same time, you cannot just fail to not to observe that what we are observing is uh, a rapidly growing uh, a rapidly growing market that it contains also a lot of what in cryptography we call snake oil so essentially products that are more relying on the hype and rather on the substance of uh, uh, the uh, qualities they have um, so the nice thing is that there are people that do recognize that, and uh, and that means that uh, that translates uh, to 
success we had in recruiting people here at the program at Edinburgh, people that would like to do research and actually invest their time in understanding their protocols and designing and thinking about the security of these protocols in the long term, rather than trying to, if you want, develop a quick solution uh, that will capitalize on the hype and just uh, participate in the, if you want, right now of the community instead of just thinking of what happens next. And I think what happens next is, um, is what's very important. And um, I do remember, if you want, the, uh, the times uh, of the Internet book in the end of 90s. Um, I happened to be a PhD student at the time in New York City. And I had a lot of friends that uh, were super excited at the time um, about, you know, the Internet revolution that was happening. Like e-commerce was happening. There were, like, companies like... Uh, uh, Google and Amazon were uh, where they were at their beginnings, and there were like amazing expectations from the wider community about uh, what might happen. And people were just making companies and raising incredible amounts of money, uh, incredible amounts of venture capital to do things that were frivolous at best. Um, at the end, I mean, this was not negative. Like so, what what we observed, like in the early two thousands, uh, was that. The whole thing, like the whole bubble burst, but but this was not to the detriment of, of the community that was engaged in that at the time. On the contrary, uh, it what happened was that companies and uh, organizations, if you want, that uh, made the right choices, they looked at the technology in a proper way, they had a good understanding of what needed to be done, and, and they had the competitive advantage in terms of know-how, they survived and not only they survived, but they flourished. And at the same time, uh, a number of companies that uh, were, were just, you know, there for the hype, they just disappeared. Um, so I have every reason to believe that what, uh, you know, what we're experiencing is, is similar in, in, in some ways. And, uh, and it's nice to have people that do recognize that uh, we have to invest in research, we have to invest in proper understanding uh, of this technology, and uh, and some of these people, I'm, I'm happy to say, that uh, are w working here at Edinburgh and are interested in uh, being part of the Blockchain Technology Lab that uh, I'm, I'm directing here at the university. So, you you talked about the, sni the snake oil and the hype and the substance, and the, the substance is the part I, found, I find very interesting myself, uh, particularly with Ouroboros and how it works. Um, for me, I see it as as a great, you know, long term solution. But um, for a lot of the, I guess, uh, challenges ahead for for the uh, for blockchain protocols that are out there. So, um, but so we'll dive a bit more into how it works. So, the uh, the incentive structure of Ouroboros was something I found very interesting. Can you give us some more insight on how it compares to Bitcoin? Oh yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's a that that's a great point because it's quite different in a number of ways. So we've designed the reward mechanism in Ouroboros in a, in a different way compared to Bitcoin. If you want, in many ways, trying to learn from uh, um, things that in Bitcoin that are designed in a certain way and they can be susceptible to certain types of of attacks to um, design the reward structure in a different way and make it more resilient to, uh, to such attacks. So, for example, like a, a well-known uh, um, well issue in uh, Bitcoin reward function is what's known as selfish mining, uh, essentially a block withholding strategy uh, that will enable uh, someone that, uh, to operate in a modified fashion compared to the standard client and potentially get more rewards than actually running the protocol as it is prescribed. So the way the rewards are happening in uh, uh, Ouroboros is by disassociating the act of producing a block from the act of validating transactions. So validating transaction, if you want, is the main work-intensive aspects of maintaining a blockchain. And what can happen in Bitcoin is that the hard work that a node in Bitcoin puts into verifying transactions can actually be uh, neglected by the system. So this happens in the following fashion. 
So suppose that you are verifying some transaction as a node in the Bitcoin network, and then you package them in the block. You are likely to find a new block, and then you issue that in the network. Um, so what would happen is that a block withholding attacker can detect that and release uh, uh, a block or perhaps two blocks ahead of you and uh, then have every other node in the network adopt this uh, fork, essentially making your block and the work that you put into it an orphan. So essentially, at that time, that all your hard work in verifying and producing, verifying transactions and producing a block was uh, released in the network could be negated by someone that is performing this type of block withholding attack. So this is a well-known issue um, in Bitcoin. And the way that uh, Ouroboros works is that we develop this notion of what we call an input endorser, who is an entity, like a node in the network, similar to the nodes that are participating uh, in producing blocks. Actually, the set of input endorsers and block producing uh, uh, nodes is just the same, but it's a different role. And their role is to just verify transactions and release them to the network. Now, this uh, set of verified transactions, which is signed by an input endorser, by an input endorser, could be included in any block within a specified period of time. So that means that your hard work in verifying those transactions is effectively guaranteed to be included in the blockchain because it has a window of opportunity of being part uh, of the blockchain. And this is by definition of the way, by the specification of the protocol. So in a nutshell, and without going into more technical details, the key point is that your hard work of verifying transactions can always be incorporated in the blockchain. And this is different compared to what's happening uh, in the Bitcoin protocol. So at the end, you can make an argument that under certain conditions, this will lead to a more fair distribution of rewards. And this is something that would capitalize on the paper to show that a certain uh, way to do the rewards that we describe in the paper is uh, is a Nash equilibrium. So you touched on an interesting point about how it's, it's more fair. Um, because from doing research uh, uh, into your work, you were saying that um, I believe each member of the community or each member of the epoch gets some reward when uh, a block is established. So would I be right in saying that uh, Ouroboros uh, and this proof-of-stake protocol is less capitalistic than, say, Bitcoin? And would it, th- would it therefore be more decentralized um, compared to, to Bitcoin? Because uh, cause the way we see Bitcoin at the moment, we have all of this pooling where we have all these miners just getting together and almost like trying to hoard every new coin that is developed. So with Ouroboros, is there less of an incentive to do something like that? Um, yeah, so regarding this, it's hard to assign a term like less capitalistic or not. So I, I would not want to do that. But something that I do like uh, about Roboros, and if you want proof of stake in general, is that you can actually run a protocol like Uroboros with an extremely lightweight infrastructure. In other words, you do not need really like very heavy uh, hashing power, like machines that can actually process a lot of uh, hashing queries uh, in order to secure the network. And that's something that I believe is more in line with deployments of blockchains um, by communities or in areas where um, such a, a heavy infrastructure in terms of hashing power is not available. So, pointing to this aspect of this protocol, I think your comment is is right on the mark. And actually, addressing this concern was one of my personal, also original motivations uh, for uh, working to get a proof of stake uh, protocol. So we'll touch back on Cardano, which you mentioned um, is is going to be using uh, Ouroboros uh, when it's released. And so one thing that I was curious when um, I read and uh, watch your videos on Ouroboros is that how you're trying to address like major problems with with Bitcoin and um, other proof of work, you could say blockchains out there, is that 
I often wonder, okay, will we ever see the switch over to these more mainstream coins? Is going with a new currency, you could say, the only way we can see Ouroboros be released into the <laughs> into the wild, you could say? Because one thing I, I would feel is that politics plays a big, big part in the in the blockchain community. And I would imagine that the only way to release Ouroboros out there is through a new blockchain because I, I can't ever imagine seeing Bitcoin uh, adopt it or even adopt proof of stake because of, of the politics surrounding it. Yeah, that's 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 correct. I mean, like it's. Uh, I mean, we've seen like you know that the way that Bitcoin evolves is um, is, is very um, slow in some sense, uh, despite the fact that our uh, well recognized and right now exhibited deficiencies in in, in the scalability aspects of, of the system. Um, this may not necessarily be a bad thing. I mean, it's uh, it's actually good to have a you know a, a wider spectrum of uh, you know currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies at the moment as the community still tries to explore fully this uh, domain. So I think it's natural for for people to experiment and and for people to try to understand and um, and provide alternative solutions. Um, politics naturally will always be an important aspect in anything that has to do with public life. And and I think cryptocurrencies are right now and will be even more so in the future um, a very important part of public life. So I, I don't see this as necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think it's important to uh, to engage uh, with uh, with uh, our community in a number of ways, and I think it's very good to have that diverging opinions and and have people like explore alternative ideas. Um, what we should steer away, I believe, is like orthodoxy, whatever you may want to define this. So there shouldn't be sort of a way of doing things just because we did them before in this way. So instead, what, what I would like to emphasize is that it's very important to adopt a scientific approach that says we do adopt things if they make sense and, and we can um, analyze them and explain their security or other performance, if you want, properties in an effective way following a scientific approach in the exposition. So um, I think that would actually bring higher value to the community and as long as this is followed, um, I'm, I'm very content that people like do try and do provide different offerings uh, in, in the wider cryptocurrency uh, domain. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with you in terms of offerings. I think it's, it's extremely important for its, uh, for its development. Uh, and just to go back to um, Nash's equilib- equilibrium, which you uh, discussed earlier on. So you say that Ouroboros is more of a representation of Nash's equilibrium than Bitcoin, which is theoretically important for a blockchain protocol. But, you know, will it matter, you know, with all all the politics that we see out there and the hype and price? Like, could it take years before people realize that these characteristics are important for a blockchain protocol instead of price potential, which people seem to be obsessed with? Yeah, well... <laughs> You know, we, we we have seen the divergence between like theoretical economics and what happens in the real world so many times over and over and over. So, and, and here there's going to be no difference. So, your point is is, is very is very good. Um, furthermore, even in the theoretical side, we are scratching the surface of completely understanding the game theoretic aspects of um, uh, of, of of these protocols. So uh, Ouroboros, with its game theoretic analysis, uh, even though it's, if it's, it's more nuanced than, than what we have for Bitcoin, it still just points to the beginning of, of what we have to do to understand from a scientific point of view the incentives that are um, associated with the, the blockchain protocols. So um, there's still more work to be done. Uh, if you want, on the scientific side, like further understand the incentives. And at the same time, we have to do that within this larger environment where, you know, there's a lot of excitement. And of course, there are like uh, people are jumping into um, 
sort of the next uh, interesting thing to do. Um, and at the end, like no matter what you say, um, if you try to do a rational analysis from a game theory point of view, there's always an aspect in human nature which is irrational. And uh, at the end, like it will be there to distort things or, or like violate what we expect from, you know, things that from what we expect from things to evolve. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? So I, I think like if we wanted to be in a completely sterile environment, like any of us that are looking at uh, the research aspect of, of blockchain protocols, we would have chosen a completely different area to work on. So um, going back to uh, another point regarding uh, proof of work that you highlighted was that so much energy goes into uh, into the Bitcoin blockchain protocol to try and you know, develop these new blocks. Uh, a lot of work is put into something and then nothing comes out of it. And of course, that highlights the big issue of en- energy consumption, the amount of energy wasted. And I've often heard the, the comment that uh, Bitcoin itself uses up more energy than Ireland does, uh, which is <laughs> kind of crazy when you think about it. So um, do you think that this is a suppressed conversation? Uh, because... Because we're in this new world where people are a lot more mindful of energy consumption. We want to be a lot more greener uh, as a world. You know, Paris Protocol we see is in is in the news a lot, and that we would like to see emerging technologies. You know, be a part of this new wave. But it seems that uh, blockchain um, technology and a lot of these currencies associated with it are going in the opposite direction. Uh, again, we're down to this whole issue of you know, the suppression of the conversation due to price. So how long do you think will be until people actually re jump onto this and realize, okay, we have to solve this problem because this is a problem that has to be solved sooner rather than later because I'm under the impression that people may not worry about this for another five, ten years, whereas they should be worrying about this today. Yeah, so it's hard to put, uh, again, like there's always this aspect of irrationality, but, but what you say I think is very important. So a lot of people really understand this now, that there's this energy expenditure um, in, uh, in a, a blockchain protocol like Bitcoin um, that we have to address, uh, and it's extremely important that we do address it, uh, and we have to do this fast. So... Um, I guess the um, the issue is that the problem is recognized, and our community, from a research and development point of view, has already done the step towards addressing it. So, proof of stake protocol like Ouroboros is an answer uh, to these concerns. Um, now, how long will it take for the community to realize it? I guess this is also depends on multiple factors, but there is no denying that. The energy expenditure that happens um, in Bitcoin is wasteful. It is put there, if you want, for a good reason, but the good reason is rather theoretical. It basically says that, yes, it is possible to build a completely permissionless system, at least theoretically speaking, that the only need the only requirement for participating is just having a computer which hashes uh, produces a certain number of hashes per second and you download this software. I mean this by itself is a remarkable um, if you want idea it's a remarkable concept and I think using this idea was the right way to come to the point that we are now. In other words Bitcoin was successful and is still very successful exactly because it is based on such a remarkable idea that it is possible to build a consensus type of protocol in this completely permissionless setting uh, that the only, if you want, barrier for you to participate in it is having a computer that can do some certain hashes per second and downloading that, uh, uh, that software. But nevertheless, now that Bitcoin brought us to the point we are today, it is the time that we have to think and say, okay, we have Bitcoin, we do appreciate what a blockchain can do, but is the Bitcoin proof-of-work-based blockchain the best way to get the benefits that Bitcoin has brought us to realize we can get? 
And, and the answer is no. And that's why a proof of stake type solutions um, are, are, are one of the possible ways that the community in the future uh, can adopt and use uh, to get all the benefits that blockchain protocols can provide. So um, I'd like to wrap it up there. Um, I would like to thank you, Aglas, for your time and all of your insight. It's, <laughs> it's been incredible to hear, uh, to hear your views on, uh, on the development of blockchain. And I would like to uh, wish you all the best with Ouroboros and I hope to hear a lot more about it in the future. Yeah, thank you, Neil, very much. It was a pleasure to be with you today.